Welcome to Peace, Love, and Robots, a podcast about anything and everything and all that is in between. I'm your host, Jeremy, and this is episode number 24 for February 17th, 2021. Sitting here at the table, staring at the lovely flowers I purchased for my wife and hoping that you all had a wonderful Valentine's Day and even a, and an even better President's Day, which is really the only holiday where it's acceptable to walk around wearing a top hat and not be confused for someone who's into steampunk. You know, if I had a dollar for every time I was walking around in my stovepipe hat and someone asked me about my opinion on polytechnics and their effect on the current readout on the weather glass, I'd have enough to buy a brand new Dynamator for use in my workshop. <laughs> Couldn't we all use a new Dynamator? I know I could. As you know, this show is brought to you by the ads you hear at the beginning and end of the show. So if you listen all the way through, I'm forever into your debt. Into your debt. No, I'm not into your debt. I'm in your debt. I'm forever in your debt. Yeah. You gotta listen to the ads all the way through. It helps. Every penny counts. I've almost made $20 in my four years of podcasting on Spreaker. $20. Yeah. But hey, the more you watch the ads, the more money I make. So every ad counts. Every playthrough counts. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for listening. But let's get on to the show because I got a lot to talk about today. That cut off really abruptly. I apologize for that. Well, anyway, I mentioned in previous episodes that I am a huge fan of Stephen King, especially The Stand. And I was really looking forward to this new adaptation on CBS All Access this winter. It was one of those uh, bright lights at the end of the tunnel. I was really hoping towards the end of 2020 to be uh, pleasantly surprised by this. And I've limited my opinion publicly to a few pithy tweets and Facebook comments, but the show completed as of yes of last Thursday, and I think now is the right time to offer up my thoughts on the series as a whole. If you haven't watched the show and you intend on doing so and you don't want to be spoiled, you may want to skip this episode. Just fast forward all the way to the end and listen to the ads and then get out of here, okay? It's going to be chock full of spoilers. I'll give you a minute to tune out. I told you. Tune out. You're still here? Get out of here. I'm warning you. Okay, now if you're still here and you don't want to be spoiled, you're just going to have to suffer the consequences. First, let me give you a summary. The stand is about a plague, appropriate for the time we're living in, that kills off most of the world's population and how the survivors rebuild society. And they have two very different approaches to it. King himself called it a dark Christian fairy tale. And at its core, it's kind of a religious text of sorts. It's about the battle of good versus evil and light versus dark. It's also a giant book, clocking in at over a thousand pages. So it's a commitment to read it. And I've read it three times since I first read it in the ninth grade. So that's a total of three times in the last uh, 30 years or so, almost 30 years, which means it has a very special place in my heart. If I'm going to go back to a book that's over a thousand pages and read it multiple times, it's got to be special. So I'm going to be brutally honest about this live ad adaptation. It left a lot to be desired. Now, I understand the book was originally written over 40 years ago, so a proper adaptation would either require it to be a period piece, which honestly I wouldn't mind, right? And it would require a lot more time. In fact, a proper adaptation would probably require about three seasons of about 12 episodes each in order to get the full scope of the story on film. But unfortunately, this vision of The Stand was a victim of its own design, Rather than tell it, trying to tell the story in as much time as possible, the choice was made to adapt it into nine one-hour episodes. Which is not nearly enough time to tell everything. Like I said, uh, uh, the ideal adaptation would be three seasons. Three seasons of about 12 episodes each. Anyway, even with that constraint, I was willing to give it a pass. One of my screenwriting professors once taught that it's bad form to use dialogue for exposition, and that's true. 
And in the first episode, meaning that by the way, it means show, don't tell. In the first episode, the writers of this adaptation shatter that rule. They don't just break it. They shatter it into a million pieces. Instead of spending time showing the plague, its beginnings, and how it started to spread, they chose to use a character to tell that story. Immediately from the first episode, I wasn't sure I would like the series as a whole. There were some good things about it. Don't get me wrong. First of all, uh, the casting of Harold Lauder was brilliant. Better than Corin Nemec from the original series, and I actually liked Greg Kinnear in the role of Glenn Bateman, the sociology professor. And even the race switch of Larry Underwood from white to black and the gender switch of Judd Harris and Ralph Bretner to women, that was fine. There, were, there, aren't enough, uh, there weren't enough strong p- characters of color in the, in the book itself, and that was great. And Larry was a great character. And for what he was given, Giovanna Depo, who played Larry, hit it out of the park. And the series was really stronger because of it. So I didn't have any problem with any of that stuff. Any of those slight changes were great. They actually made it better than it was. And I'm glad that unlike the miniseries, they didn't combine Rita and Nadine into one character. Both of them were performed well. And I'm still shocked that Heather Graham's 50. She was perfect as Rita. And the thing is, both of them represented totally different aspects of Larry's story. Rita is his first failure, and Nadine was his second And Rita, he was trying and didn't try very hard. He actually got annoyed by her. And then Nadine, he tried and tried and tried. And clearly, uh, she was meant for something else. James Marsden was serviceable as Stu. I didn't really have a problem with him. But he didn't have any do anything to make his performance any more special. He wasn't Gary Sinise. I actually missed Gary Sinise in the role. But now Gary Sinise is, what, 60 years old? It would look real weird with him and uh, Franny, especially the girl who played Franny, Odessa Young. Uh, she's probably old enough to be his daughter, so that would be weird. Uh, but she was fine. She was better than Molly Ringwald. I didn't have a problem with her, uh, Molly Ringwald, in the original. A lot of people didn't like her, thought she was kind of wooden, and I, I see where they're coming from. And they have valid criticisms, but I didn't have a problem with her. But Odessa Young was better, and probably because she was given a lot more to do. Uh, Franny was an important character in the book, and uh, in the in the miniseries, she was sort of just there, and this made her more important than uh, than in the miniseries. But anyway, I'd also be remiss if I did not praise Alexander Skarsgård as Randall Flagg. He was the most perfect casting of them all. He was great. He was intimidating. He was charming. He was everything that the Dark Man had to be, and I appreciated. Uh, what he put into the role, his casting and even his costuming was perfect. It was everything I envisioned to be Randall Flagg when I read the book the first time. But let me go back to Harold for a moment. In this version, Harold is so much more than the jilted lover in this TV version because he's much closer to the book. He was the embodiment of Harold in the book without being fat and sweaty. It was just this uh, modern day incel exacting revenge in the darkest way possible. And honestly, I'm looking forward to seeing what else Owen Teague does in his actor because he was just top notch. He was the best character overall in the in the entire series. Best acted, best written overall. Anyway, that's about all the praise that I have for the show. So let me get to the complaints. And there are a lot of them. And I apologize for being so negative. Uh, We're trying to be positive in 2021, but I got to be negative about the stand. I mentioned earlier that they weren't given enough time. The pacing of the show was way too fast, too fast to explain what was going on, too fast to get invested in any of the characters or their story arcs or their relationships. For example, one of the core relationships of the show, of the book, is between deaf and blind Nick Andros and his travel companion, slow but sweet Tom Cullen. In the book, you see them grow as friends in their journey to find Mother Abigail, and when they send Tom off to spy on the dark man in Vegas... You can actually feel the sorrow between the two. They tried to pull it off in this TV series, but it did not feel right. Mostly because you did not see them come close together. They just seemed to be random characters thrown together for a few episodes or a couple of minutes. They, they didn't, you didn't see them grow as friends. In the series, you only see them together a handful of time. You never get a sense of how close they are. Tom was fine for what he was in the show, although I will always prefer the original actor from the series. I can't remember his name, but uh, he played Dauber on Coach. He was great. He's the guy I envision every time I read uh, Tom Cullen in uh, in The Stand. He, he's the guy I see. But Nick, 
Nick got done dirty by this adaptation. Like Nick was probably the uh, the worst adapted character in the show. He was so important in the books. He was a narrator because they jump around to different characters. He wasn't a narrator, but he was the focus of several chapters in the book. He was very, very, very important. But in this show, they don't even give him much screen time, let alone tell you much about who he was or his connection with Mother Abigail. By the time Nick dies, you're supposed to care. But I didn't. I didn't even know who Nick was. He was just a blind guy with an eye patch or a deaf guy with an eye patch. Blind guy with an eye patch would be really, really weird. That'd be cruel to put an eye patch on a blind guy, wouldn't it? No. Anyway, he's a deaf guy with an eye patch, and that's about it, who apparently speaks for Mother Abigail. But I don't uh, – there was nothing. There was nothing. He was just there, and it, it's unfortunate because Nick is a very well-layered and well-written character for the book. It just did not he, – he, they done him dirty. They done him dirty. And what about Mother Abigail? Okay. Whoopi Goldberg, she looked the part, and that's about it. She was written as this delusional old woman, and Hemingford Home was turned into a joke. It was a parody of itself. They turned it into a nursing home. I know they, they had to sneak in the Stephen King cameo, and they did that in the photo. That was funny. Ha, ha, ha. But in a world where there are two powerful sides to the coin— no wonder Vegas seemed way cooler. Not to mention that, there's no reason really given for why her people were so devoted to her. Sure, she showed up in a couple of dreams, but that's about it. It just didn't make sense. Conversely, it's obvious why the Dark Man had loyal subjects in his inner circle. But there's no reason for me to believe why any of the main characters in Boulder should be so loyal as to die for Mother Abigail. At its core, this made the show much weaker. It took the spine out of it. Lloyd Henry might also be, might have been the worst shift from the book possible outside of Nick. In the, in the original miniseries, Miguel Ferrar was great. He was more menacing. And this Lloyd felt like a joke. This Lloyd actually felt like a guy that after a while I'd want to punch in the face. <laughs> he just, he was a whiny, just just a cre. I don't know. I did not like him. Maybe it's an age thing. I'm not sure. He did he did not seem to be a character well adapted on screen, and it felt like a joke. It didn't seem like the same character. In fact, I was more scared of Julie Lawry than I was Lloyd because Julie would just fly off the handle in the book, and she did the same thing in the show. I did like that they put the writer the writers put those two together though. That kind of made sense. That was kind of cool. Ezra Miller, who uh, was the one stunt casting that they treated like a big deal, but <laughs> who really cared? He's Ezra Miller. He's in The Flash. That's about it, right? I don't know what – what else has Ezra Miller done besides The Flash? I don't know. I don't care. I'm not even going to look it up. But he was the trash can man, and, well, it was certainly a choice. Matt Frewer was kind of a joke as trashy in the original series, and – Ezra Miller decided to play him as a far more malevolent and perverted version of Leonardo DiCaprio's character in What's Eating Gilbert Grape, and it didn't work. It was bad. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the last episode either, because this is where they there was a huge shift from the book with the final episode. I don't know if they left it open to continue this series. I really hope they didn't. But in the, in the last episode, instead of focusing on Tom and Stu's journey back to Boulder, where it sort of like created this bond between Tom and Stu, it sort of put Stu in the place of Nick. Of course, we're not going to see their journey. That makes sense because Stu becomes the new Nick to Tom for a while. And uh, it focused instead on Stu and Franny leaving Boulder and returning to Maine, something we don't see in the book. We only saw the ending where, they're si where they return to Maine because that's where – Franny wanted to go. We don't see how they get there or anything. And uh, so they decided to focus on that. And this led to a completely convoluted mess of a twist involving the powers of Mother Abigail and Randall Flagg continuing their war in different forms. And since Mother Abigail was barely fleshed out in the previous episodes, her showing up as some magical younger version of herself healer in the last episode, it felt like a joke. It honestly felt like a joke. 